I'm Dr. Gene Jose, Department of Radiology, University of Miami, Medical Director of the Lennar Foundation Medical Center. And we're here to introduce you to the fundamentals of musculoskeletal ultrasound imaging. I'm joined by Louis Payro, ultrasound supervisor for the Lennar Foundation Medical Center, and Nikhil Patel, medical student at the University of Miami School of Medicine, that will serve as our Hey everyone, this is Richard Wang, one of the radiology residents. I'm going to be going over basic MSK ultrasound of the shoulder. Here's an outline of what I'll be covering today. Uh, this is for educational purposes only. I have no financial disclosures. So basics. Because of the various positioning and orientation of the different structures, it's best to describe them in long and short axis rather than coronal, sagittal, or axial. Uh, regarding the MSK structures, normal tendons are echogenic with multiple parallel echogenic lines reflecting the internal fibrillar orientation. Uh, ligaments also share this appearance but are a little bit more compact. Uh, on the bottom left you can see uh, ultrasound of normal Achilles tendon in both uh, long and short axis. And as for muscles on the top right, they're more hypoechoic with interspersed small echogenic lines reflecting the fiber adipose tissue. Uh, this is a short and long axis view of the gastrocnemius muscle. Uh, on the bottom right, we can see this is a median nerve. Uh, nerves have more of a fasciculated appearance, sometimes described as honeycombing. Uh, the nerves themselves are dark with low echogenicity with surrounding epi and perineurium that's bright, which contains fatty tissue. These are some of the transducers that we use in MSK ultrasound. The left two are the high frequency linear transducers. The right is a low frequency curvilinear transducer. The high frequency linear transducers are better for looking at superficial structures, while the low frequency one is better for looking at deeper structures. Uh, for the shoulder, we'll mostly be using the middle high frequency linear transducer. So anisotropy is probably the most important artifact in MSK ultrasound. The idea is that normally tendons and ligaments have a parallel arrangement as I mentioned before. When there is some derangement such as a tear, then the orientation of the fibers are lost uh, as we'll see later on. Uh, for MSK ultrasound, it is important to make sure the probe is pointing perpendicular so the sound beams are hitting the structure of interest at a 90 degree angle for optimal reflection. Even small deviations in angulation can make it seem like there's a tear when there isn't. Uh, the bottom right shows an example of anisotropy at the insertion of the supraspinatus tendon. The long head of the biceps tendon comes from the supraglenoid tubercle. It has both an intra and extra articular portion. Uh, as it passes through the rotator interval, it goes into the bicepto groove at the proximal humerus. The first step of evaluation is to rotate the arm so the hand is pointing to the contralateral side to expose the groove. The images show normal echogenic biceps tendon between the greater and lesser tuberosities at the top right. And as you move the transducer up, you can see the intraarticular portion of the long head uh, within the rotator interval between the supraspinatus and subscapularis muscles. If you go down, you'll see the myotendinous junction where the tendon transitions into the muscle. The subscapularis muscle lies in front of the scapula with its tendinous insertion mainly at the lesser tuberosity. For positioning, you want to rotate the arm externally so you can see the subscapularis tendon better. Uh, the images show the echogenic tendinous attachment to the lesser tuberosity. The bottom right image shows a short axis view of a normal multi-pennant appearance. The supraspinatus muscle is located in the suprascapular fossa and inserts at the greater tuberosity. Uh, you want to position the patient so the arm is internally rotated. This makes it so the supraspinatus is more of an anterior structure, making it easier to evaluate. The infraspinatus muscle is posterior to the scapula, right below the scapular spine. The teres minor muscle is right below this, both attached to the greater tuberosity. For positioning, you want to place the hand so it's pointing to the opposite side 
or across your shoulder, similar to the positioning of the long head of the biceps tendon. Uh, use the spine of the scapula as a landmark. Move the transducer down to see the infraspinatus and more down to see the teres minor muscle. At the level of the infraspinatus and teres minor, if you move a little more medially, you can sometimes see the posterior labrum. Uh, often you have to increase the depth, and sometimes it's difficult to see depending on the patient. At the top of the shoulder, you can find the acromioclavicular joint. The normal width is approximately 3 to 4 millimeters. Uh, if there's any question, compare it with the contralateral side, and there shouldn't be more than a 2 to 3 millimeter difference. Uh, make sure to sweep through the AC joint to look for an osochromiale. Here I'll go through the basic concepts of the spectrum referred to as tendinopathy. Normally tendons are well organized and have an echogenic fibrillar pattern as seen on the top left. However, this organization can get disrupted to different degrees. At the bottom left, there's low-grade micro tears that cause inflammation and edema, which disrupts the internal arrangement of the tendon, le leading to a thickened tendon with slightly decreased echogenicity. Sometimes you can see neovascularity as well. This is referred to as tendinosis. At the top right, when there's a more discrete linear anechoic focus, this is referred to as a tear. They can be referred to as bursal, intrasubstance, or articular sided, depending on which side the tear is facing. At the bottom right, on short and long axis views, there's a discrete anechoic region involving the entire thickness of the supraspinatus tendon. This is referred to as a full thickness tear. On this side, we can see both short and long axis views of the long head of the biceps tendon, which is thickened with slightly decreased echogenicity, as well as fluid due to inflammation of the synovial membrane surrounding the tendon. Uh, this is referred to as tendinosis and tenosynovitis. Here we have dislocation of the long head of biceps tendon with the echogenic tendon on screen right outside of the bicepital groove. This is an example of glenohumeral joint effusion. We can see an anechoic region deep to the tendon at the glenohumeral joint. On the left, we have fluid within the potential space known as the subacromial subdeltoid bursa. It's commonly associated with rotator cuff full thickness tears. On the right, we have complex fluid within the subacromial subdeltoid bursa with surrounding pronounced hyperemia and bursal thickening. This is a case of calcific tendinopathy, most commonly caused by hydroxyapatite deposition within the tendon that later calcifies and starts to resorb which can cause pain. They look like fluffy, hyperechoic regions within the tendon. They may or may not have posterior acoustic shadowing depending on the state of calcification. These are images of the left and right shoulders of a patient experiencing right shoulder pain. We can see on the right that the supraspinatus muscle denoted by the S shows increased echogenicity due to increased fatty tissue as well as size asymmetry with the right supraspinatus muscle being smaller than the left. This is basic ultrasound scanning of the shoulder. We want to use a linear uh, transducer. We prefer the 18 uh, linear 6. With the patient positioned with their arm on their side and their elbow flexed at 90 degrees, we're going to begin by placing the transducer in the front of the humeral uh, diaphysis and we're going to find the pectoralis major tendon. From there we're going to scan up interrogating the long head of the biceps tendon in short axis and then we're going to turn the transducer and we're going to evaluate it in long axis. Next, we're going to externally rotate the patient's hand. This is so that the lesser tuberosity moves outside and we can see the subscapularis tendon. The subscapularis tendon will be situated on the anterior aspect of the humeral head. You'll be interrogating the subscapularis tendon in long axis and also in short axis, from medial to lateral. We'll reach over to their shoulder. The transducer is placed in the back of the humerus and then we're going to be looking for the teres minor 
tendon and a little bit more proximal, we will find the infraspinatus tendon. We will interrogate those structures in long axis and then turn the transducer and interrogate it in short axis. Also in the back of the shoulder, we're going to look at the glenohumeral joint, the posterior labrum, and then finally the condition of the muscles of the infraspinatus and teres minor. Lastly, we're going to ask the patient to reach back for their back pocket. This pushes the humeral head anteriorly. The transducer is then placed on the front of the humerus, and the supraspinatus tendon is interrogated both in long axis and in short axis. We will note the subdeltoid subacromial bursa as well. Then we will ask the patient to drop the trans their arm to the side. The transducer is placed on the top of the shoulder to find the acromioclavicular joint, and that is interrogated both in uh, long and short axis. And then we move the transducer towards the neck in this position to evaluate the supraspinatus muscle belly. That concludes the basic sonographic evaluation of the shoulder. Thank you.